So today I'm going to get a bit ahead of myself by looking backwards. Welcome to Gorham Preserve. I'm Carter and I'm so glad you're here today. I have a recipe that I actually did during the Every Bit Counts Challenge August 2023 and it was in the video footage, it was sped up in a compilation of a lot of different preservation projects and it kind of got lost. And at the time I didn't know what a special recipe it was going to be for us. We love this. We enjoyed this so much that I actually planned my garden around a few of the things that I am going to need to make this recipe. So I wanted to go ahead and get it out to you now. I know that most of us don't have tomatoes and peppers coming out of the garden right now, but in my zone, I won't have them coming out of the garden until at least ripe peppers, colored peppers, until the end of September. And, and that, that, that's just too long to wait. You know, all you folks in the South, you're gonna miss out on this amazing recipe. So I'm gonna go ahead and put it out there. It'll be a standalone video, so it's searchable. You can come back and find it whenever your produce is coming out of the garden or your farmer's market is up and running or you just find a great deal on something at the grocery store. This is one so worth doing and it keeps quite a long time in the refrigerator after it's been fermented. So what we are doing today is lacto-fermented pico de gallo. This is from a book called The Hands-On Home. So I think we're going to do some more recipes from this book this summer. I have done two now, and both of them have weighed heavily in terms of my preservation plan for this year and my gardening plan for this year. So, so far, I've batten a thousand <laughs> out of this book. So hopefully we can find some more to do throughout the summer. But this one is special enough to go ahead and get out to you now so that you have it whenever you need it. All right, so we're going to go back to some of last year's footage and I'm gonna walk you through this recipe so that you'll have it when you need it. All right, let's jump right in with the ingredients. You're gonna need about two pounds of tomatoes, and this can be any type of tomatoes. You can see here I'm using Romas, but if you have uh, beef steaks, that's just fine as well. Even if you have cherry tomatoes, you can probably use those as well. You're gonna to wanna to dice them up make about four cups worth of tomatoes. Now I'm gonna do all of this chopping by hand because I actually kind of find it therapeutic and I love to see all the pretty colors go together. But you can certainly do this in a food processor. If you do that, try to keep each vegetable separate because the tomatoes will turn to mush if you're trying to process them at the same time as you are the peppers or the onions. So just keep those separate and then you can certainly do it that way if you don't want quite as chunky of a salsa or if you just don't have as much time, frankly. So after we get the tomatoes chopped, we're gonna go into a pound of onions. We're gonna peel and chop those. That'll be about two cups of onions. And then the recipe calls for three quarters of a pound of green or red bell pepper seeded and chopped or about one and a half cups. Well, I looked at all the colors in my bowl here and I didn't want green because a, I'm not a huge fan of green peppers, but I do have green jalapenos here. And I didn't really want red because I had red tomatoes going in. So I thought, okay, yellow or orange. And I happen to have yellow peppers coming out of the garden. So that's what I chose, and I'm so glad I did. When you see the end result of this, I think the colors are just so beautiful. So along with the yellow uh, sweet peppers, I'm gonna use two maybe even three medium-sized jalapenos. I like to get the seeds and the ribs out and then chop those pretty finely. A couple of garlic cloves. I always try to use more garlic just because I like it so much and I think fermented garlic has such a great taste. A big bunch of cilantro, trimmed and chopped. So this is kind of the trick in getting all of this to come out of the garden at the same time, right? Because cilantro likes the cool, tomatoes and peppers like it hot. So my trick this year, or my goal this year rather, is going to be able to grow as much cilantro as I need to keep this going inside down in the grow room so that I have it ready at the same time my peppers have turned the right color uh, for me to start making the pico. So if you don't like cilantro, I know, I know some people don't like cilantro, so flat leaf parsley, uh, so it's a bit of a stronger flavor, but you can use some of that. I don't know if you want to use as much of that as 
the recipe calls for cilantro, but maybe half as much would be very good. And then we're going to do half a cup of freshly squeezed lime juice and then four teaspoons of fine sea salt. And then we're going to add one teaspoon of ground cumin. A couple of other garden considerations for me were to make sure that I had plenty of yellow and orange peppers planted and that I plant a second round of Roma tomatoes so that I do have some after that first blush is through into September I'll have plenty of fresh Romas. Let's talk a little bit about fermentation. You know I have been canning for I don't even know how long now 15 years at least I think but fermenting I've only been doing fermenting in maybe five years or so and you know, I was hesitant to get into it because there was so much I didn't know. It seemed like this kind of woo-woo kind of thing, right? You know, you want it to ferment. You want bacteria and all this stuff going on, but you don't want the bad bacteria. You don't want this going on. You don't want mold going on. Where's that fine line? And, it, you know, kind of like you folks starting up with canning, there's this big vacuum of questions. What's good? What's not good? How do you know? Well, research and practice, I think, are the two keys. So I started fermenting, I guess, with, well, kombucha and sauerkraut, hot sauce, pickles. You know, I've been doing those for several years now. Last year was the first year I did this fermented pico recipe. And it just, it was eye-opening to me how much I had been missing <laughs> all these years. So let's talk about the various ways that fermentation can happen. So let's say that we are going to ferment tea. That turns it into kombucha. We're going to ferment fruit. We can turn that into vinegar or we can turn that into wine. We can ferment milk and turn it into yogurt or kefir. Now in these cases, we're going to need a SCOBY or a starter liquid or some other form of inoculant to get the fermentation process started. In this case, we're going to ferment vegetables. And we're doing that with the help of lactic acid bacteria, which is, is pretty much everywhere. And it certainly lives on the surface of these vegetables that we're going to ferment. And that is the bacteria that when we put it into a salted anaerobic environment, meaning underneath the liquid, not exposed to oxygen, it is going to thrive. And it is going to thrive so much that it is going to keep any other bad bacteria from coming into that environment and spoiling your ferment. And it is going to take the pH level down and lowering that pH is going to further ensure the safety of that food while we have it preserved. So as those good bacteria become active and start growing in this fermentation process, you'll start to see little bubbles coming up in your ferment, and that's when you know things are starting to happen. Then it's just a matter of time, and to me it's a matter of taste. Generally speaking, with a pico de gallo, people will say anywhere from two to four days. I've seen somebody say one day, but I don't think that it's really fermented enough at that point. At that point, you're really gonna to have to stick it in the fridge and eat it within a few days because it's just basically salsa. The bacteria are not there in sufficient numbers to preserve the pico. So I think at least two days. In my case, I let it go five days and I think that tang is absolutely fantastic. When I do more this summer, I'll probably do some toward the end of my produce season. I'll probably do some for two days and then put it in the refrigerator. Because what happens when you put it in the refrigerator is not all fermentation doesn't stop. It just slows down a lot. So if I've only fermented for two days, maybe by the end of four months or six months, it's at that fermentation level of... I don't know, five days, six days, something like that, which I like a lot. So in my opinion, that one day is just, it's not even a fermentation. It's just kind of a, oops, I left it out on the counter and forgot to stick it in the fridge kind of thing. In which case you're going to need to put it in the fridge and eat it within, you know, two, three, four days, just like you would with a fresh pico, only this one has started to deteriorate uh, beforehand. So you really need the fermentation to, um, to be active and you need that pH level to start to drop. 
You need to get that lactobacillus going in here and it is going to fend off any kind of bad bacteria that could start up in here. So that's what we're looking for. Other than that, it's based on, on your taste. Do you like a really uh, pungent, twangy ferment? In which case, maybe you go four or five days. If you're just kind of easing into fermentation, maybe you start with two days, maybe even three days on this one. When you do your pickles or your sauerkraut, you'll probably go longer than you will on, on this. So it's, you know, it's just something you're gonna have to, to figure out what works best for you and play with it. But there are so many benefits to having the fermented foods in the refrigerator. So let's talk about what's so great about fermenting. So the first and, and foremost to me is that fermentation enhances the nutritional value of foods. So during that fermentation process, when the beneficial bacteria are breaking down sugars and starches, they make all those nutrients in the food more bioavailable. This means you get more bang for your buck when you eat a fermented food than you do eating, say this fresh pico. Secondly, the fermentation promotes gut health. They're rich in probiotics, and in fact, if you eat a wide variety of fermented foods, you'll get a wide variety of probiotics. So while fermented vegetables may have a lot of the lactic acid bacteria, so the lactobacillus, several different strains of that, if you then eat um, like tempeh or miso or yogurt, you'll get additional strains of bacteria or good probiotics added to your gut and that all helps to make a much healthier gut microbiome. Let's talk about the tools you're going to need to do a nice ferment. You're going to need a vessel for one thing. So glass or food safe ceramic are far preferable to anything plastic. You're going to need something to weight down the vegetables or fruit that we are fermenting. You want to keep them underneath the liquid because as long as they're underneath the liquid, they are safe from mold. So they make glass weights specifically. You'll see that that's what I use here. You can also use a little four ounce uh, jelly jar and just stick it in there and push down and keep all of the food particles uh, below by using that. It can be filled with uh, fermentation brine. It can be filled with a plastic bag full of water. So there are a couple of different ways to do it. You don't necessarily have to buy anything. And then you're going to need a lid for this. And you want your lid to have air be able to pass through. So you could use a coffee filter. If your jar is not so full, it's going to bubble over. You can use one of those white plastic lids that fit the ball jars and just every now and then loosen it up a little bit so a little air escapes. You can use the regular two-piece ball lid and ring but you're going to want to basically burp the jar every now and then to let the air escape. You can use what I'm going to use which is a little pickle pipe. It just has a little hole at the top of uh, the little bump in the center and that allows air, you know, fizz, the carbonation that's produced as the fermentation goes on, it allows it to escape. So I don't have to worry about um, anything getting too, too crazy in there. So all of these things we need to be really clean going into this. We don't want to introduce any type of other bad bacteria or food particles that may be contaminated with something into this mix. So we want clean jars, clean hands, clean lids, clean fruit, clean vegetables. So here's, here's one thing to think about, and I've researched this and I haven't found an answer. So if you happen to know an answer or have seen an answer somewhere, I wish you would let me know. This new stuff they're using on produce, this appeal, this natural, stuff that they're using to keep produce fresh longer. I don't know if that affects the fermentation process or not. So in my case, I'm going to work very hard to use only 
fruits and vegetables from my garden so that I know that you know there's none of that on there and there are no chemicals sprayed on anything in my garden but I know that's just not possible for everyone so if you have some answers on that or some thoughts on that please feel free to discuss it below so my goal coming out of this harvest season is to have a wide variety of fermented foods in my refrigerator that we can eat for several months. You know, I have fermented pickles that have lasted a year uh, easily in a half gallon uh, jar. So I'll have plenty of those. I don't know that I'll get this to last a year, but you know, we'll see. But having the different varieties of fermented foods offers you a wide range of probiotics and it's that wide range that is going to be so beneficial to the gut. And that is going to be my defense against, you know, whatever whatever pops up uh, this crazy winter with all the flus and everything else. So I hope that you will join me in this, and I hope that you will have a refrigerator full of beautiful and tasty ferments at the end of the season. And that was Lacte Fermented Pico de Gallo. I hope you will enjoy this as much as we did because I intend to have probably an entire garage refrigerator shelf dedicated to this stuff by the end of the season. We just, we love it and it lasts, it lasts for several months. The author says she's actually had one last for a year, but it lasts for at least four months, you know, six months would be fine, but you have to have enough to actually not be eaten before six months. Last year, I didn't make enough. I, it was, I don't know, I didn't make enough. I should have made more. This year, I'm gonna fix that. So thank you so much for being here. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you next week. Bye-bye.